My name is Jonathan Rowson, and welcome to today's event, which goes by many names. Jazz and Blues was the title. Um, that's part of a broader inquiry here at Perspectiva, exploratory inquiry, uh, very early stages about the relationship between music and the challenges of our times, um, sometimes captured by the expression, the meta crisis. And today we'll speak less about the meta crisis and more about music. But I'm just here to very briefly introduce our main speakers and explain why we might be interested in this inquiry. Um, Nietzsche famously said, without music, life would be a mistake. And that can be a bumper sticker or a t-shirt slogan. Um, but it could also be a very profound point. It could also be something about music's perennial and fundamental nature. We we know, for instance, that we it, it looks as though we sang before we talked, for example. We know that music was is critical for all sorts of group formation. And um, we also know that music is central to how people feel. And we're in a time where feelings have cosmic significance. How we orient ourselves to the world, how we respond to the challenges of our time, will be shaped by our sensibilities. And our sensibilities will be shaped by, in large part, what we're experiencing. And music is an aspect of that. So my, my intuition on this project is that somehow we need to get a feeling for uh, a deep appreciation for music's capacity, not only to reflect the world, but potentially also change it. Um, not only to um, give solace and consolation in a difficult world, but potentially intimate and indicate ways that we might reconceptualize it and, and be in it in a different way. That remains all fairly nebulous and uh, op opaque at the moment, but that's why we want to begin the inquiry. You have a sense of a thread that you have to pull to, to make sense of what's there, and that's what um, that's what's underway. And so that's that's what follows. With that in mind, I'm delighted to introduce our two main speakers this evening. I may rejoin for a question later on, but I'm really here mostly to introduce, first of all, my colleague, Michael. Michael Bredy is the Associate Director of Community at Perspectiva, and he's also the founder and director of the Youth Mindfulness Program, which is a Glasgow-based charity that has trained thousands of educators in more than 50 countries across the world to share mindfulness meditation with hundreds of thousands of children and teenagers. He has also worked as a professional pianist and singer playing blues and soul to fund his charity in the early days. So a wonderful story of, as as I've heard in other contexts, people playing music to make ends meet to, to get to their other work as well. And then um, Michael recently wrote a post called Music uh, Metanoia, Met Music Metacrisis and Metanoia, I believe. And uh, we'll share a link to that in the chat that can give some of the intellectual background to this exploration. But we wouldn't want to venture into this without calling upon significant body of expertise and insight and experience from elsewhere in the world. And in that sense, we're really very happy to bring Greg Thomas to the conversation. Greg Thomas is the chief executive officer of the Jazz Leadership Project, which is by itself just a very charming notion. He's a writer, teacher, and entrepreneur. Greg has written about culture, race, and democratic life in publications ranging from The Village Voice, Integral Life, New Republic, Salon, Uptown, The Root, The Guardian, The Observer, and The New York Daily News as a jazz columnist. Greg has contributed to two books centering on the work and thought of his mentor, Albert Murray, Albert Murray and the Aesthetic Imagination of a Nation, and Murray Talks Music, Albert Murray on Jazz and Blues, for which he penned the afterword. Greg has lectured on American cultural history and jazz at Columbia, jazz at Lincoln Center, Hamilton College, and at Harvard. Um, so th that's a very brief introduction to both of our speakers, and I'm just keen that they get on with it. Um, but I suppose before they do, we're going to have a, we will have a little bit of music just to let you know, um, because just as you can't really understand food without tasting it, you can't really understand music without hearing it. And while that's a little harder in an online event, we will do what we can. Um, so with that thought in mind, I pass it over initially to Michael and look forward to the conversation. And I'll join you again a little later. Michael, feel free to evict me from the main screen. Bye Thank for now. you so much, Jonathan. Cheers. Cheers. Okay, well, hi everyone, and uh, hey Greg, it's uh, I'm really excited to be in conversation with you, and um, 
yeah, thank you. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm glad to be here in conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. with you and and the folks who are here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, I'm so I'm 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 really excited to get into a lot of different topics and i know we have maybe about 50 minutes or so for the first part of this conversation um probably been far too ambitious than the amount i want to cover but uh the way i, I wanted to actually start uh greg is a kind of prelude to the first question i have for you by telling you a, a very short story which was um when i was about five and a half years old my family and i um my parents decided to go to take us on a summer holiday down to the south of England. And so that involved from Glasgow going down to the south of England, about a seven and a half hour drive. And so my mum and dad thought, okay, we better get something to keep these kids occupied. Otherwise this is going to be terrible, you know? So they bought us these Walkmans, you know, these like kind of portable tape players. And they, you know, had the nursery rhymes and the kind of kitty songs. But actually I managed to get hold of some of my dad's tapes, which were some kind of, blues and soul compilations and actually i remember a, a little richard compilation right now of course little richard a little bit more in the rock and roll genre than, than jazz but so much from that kind of louis jordan i've heard you speak about him that kind of tradition you know and uh, so at five and a half years old <clears throat> i just listened to this tape you know on repeat like all the way down and back up and that was my initiation that was my first kind of uh, foray into the African-American musical kind of heritage. And, and, and I fell in love with it. And um, so I wanted to, I wanted to really start by asking you about your initiation. What was, how did this, this kind of love that you have for this music and this, what's really become the vacation in your life? How did it, where did it start? How did it, how did it come alive for you? Well, music was all around me um in in my in my youth um not only in terms of pop music but blues jazz gospel uh r and b because my parents uh listened to that music um my mom had those genres in uh, and those art forms in her record collection as did my dad they they were separated pretty early in my life but they both love music. But then there's my wider family. There's, you know, getting together. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. <clears throat> Excuse me, getting together to, and going down south in the summers to Waycross, Georgia. And I was born in 1963. So, you know, I'm three, four, five years old. And they're put on James Brown. And I'm, you know, dancing and doing the moves that I see that James Brown does. And they're gathering around. So, I mean, music is a part, ultimately, of Afro-American history, heritage, and culture, mm. a, 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 an indelible part. So um, it is uh, something that is a life-sustaining force um, of survival, of making it through uh, difficult days and, and the week, of of hard work or trying to get work or something, you know. Mm. Um, so it starts with family and extends out to uh, listening to the radio and s seeing it on television. But it's it's just been foundational uh, for me and became more so, you know, in my teen years, which I'm sure I get a chance to talk about. And was that was it in your teen years when you you started to? Because it, it seems to me, from my understanding of you, that you have a particular. Um, love of jazz and and a particular relationship with jazz. Could you say a little bit more about that? Glad to, glad to. So the foundation was laid because um, jazz was very influential in the, in the country in in the United States. Um, you know, from the twenties and thirties, and the thirties actually it was the popular music of the nation. Forties, um, fifties. <clears throat> I was born in the early sixties. So even though by the sixties um, rock and roll, soul, um, f what became funk is, is, is more prominent than jazz was, you have remnants. So mm. you still have the use of uh, instruments in the music. You still have uh, soul and R&B groups and singers who will, you know, themselves sing jazz uh, or or play a jazz cut or jazz styling 
uh, Marvin Gaye singing standards. James Brown, along with Louis Belson, had a recording of jazz and jazz blues and jazz standards and stuff. I mean, oh, so right, there, yeah. there are many examples of the the OJ's R and B group, the Spinners. Yeah, you know, so it was still there. And in the seventies, as I was coming up, you had the integration of orchestras and still bands with music and horn sections and such. So, but specifically for me, it was in high school that I, I really got the jazz bug, so to speak. Um, I was born in Brooklyn. We moved from Brooklyn. My, my mother, <clears throat> excuse me, my mother and my sister and I moved from Brooklyn to Staten Island in um, 76, 77, went to junior high school there. And um, when I went to high school, Tottenville High School in Staten Island, in 10th grade, towards the end of the year, there was a concert by the stage band, which is basically a big band. Mm -hmm. um, and by big band, I'm sure most people know what we mean. But you know, you're talking about a, a rhythm section, piano, bass, drums, and various other sections, a saxophone section with alto, tenor, and baritone, saxophone, trumpet section, trombone section, okay? And so this stage band was playing music of the day, um, you know, popular stuff by Herbie Hancock, who was one of the greatest jazz pianists of the last half of the 20th century. Um, by Steely Dan, by Spyro Gyra, you know. But they're also playing cuts by Duke Ellington and Count Basie. And this music just went through my body in such a way that I was like, oh my goodness, this is something. I'm seeing my peers up there playing mm -hmm. and expressing themselves and being in concert literally and physically and, and, and um, figuratively. <laughs> And I was excited. I was motivated. So I picked up the alto saxophone. I borrowed one. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Uh, I borrowed one from the high school, uh, a Bundy Selmer alto saxophone to learn how to play. Got different music books and, you know, worked on my long tones and the basics of music. I had played recorder earlier in my, my musical life, as many, you know, at least do or did at the time. So I had some basic understanding of music, but when I jumped into the alto saxophone, I started to listen to the greats on alto saxophone and other saxophones and just jazz generally. I immersed myself in jazz. I would wake up listening to it on the radio in the morning. I would come home, listen to it. I would go to sleep with the playing, you know, wow. I, I, I just totally, uh, immerse myself. And within two years, I not only had played in various musical configurations at the high school, but I joined the very stage band that influenced me as a, as a sophomore. Um, so that was great. Went on to college, Hamilton College, where I minored in music. My Hamilton College is located in central New York. And that took me through uh, a survey history of the Western classical um trajectory historical trajectory yeah, uh, yeah and allowed me to play you know various in various groups and to have an experience which totally changed my life whereas mm -hmm. i could say that the experience of hearing the stage band as a sophomore was like uh, being on the road to damascus and being blinded by you know this powerful yeah. music i would say that i went through an initiatory experience in college where i had the chance to play with the legendary brass man clark terry uh who as as i like to say he went through his his graduate and postgraduate studies with the Count Basie Orchestra and the Duke Ellington Orchestra. You're talking about the creme de la creme mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of jazz big bands. <laughs> and I got a chance to meet him and play with him at a concert at Hamilton College. And it was 
it was a spiritual experience. It was, I played with him, squeeze me, but please don't tease me by <laughs> Duke Ellington. <laughs> and, and standing next to this man and then hearing him take an incredible solo with his unique technique called doodle tonguing, where he plays double time passages, these brisk, high velocity passages and comes back in right in the groove. I mean, yeah. it was incredible. It was life changing. And I've devoted myself in one way or the other to the music uh, ever since. It's so interesting, Greg. You, you like there's there's some things you say there that, um, in the previous session we had when when, when I talked about uh, did a workshop on music metacrisis and metanoia, I showed this clip from the Blues Brothers film, where there's this moment that kind of shows a metanoia experience from one of the characters. The heavens open up, the light comes down, and it <laughs> happens as a result of the gospel music. Right. But it's it's interesting was you speak about these kind of peak experiences you have. You know, the first time you listen to listen to the big band, then you're playing at, at, at university, you know, and these kind of experiences that I don't know. I mean, it could you could feel like you're gonna you're gonna explode with the ecstasy or the joy or something. But then that also then kind of draws you into the practice. Like once you have that peak experience, then that's the thing that lights the spark that says, right, I want to train in this. I want to become, I want to hone this. It, it's the thing that draws you back. And, and there's something that seems like kind of a, a parallel to spiritual experiences and practice where people have a spiritual awakening and then like, right now I need to do my spiritual practice to, you know, there's an interesting parallel there. Oh, definitely the parallel. Um, many, I mean, it became not just entertainment for me, it became um, a source of discipline, a, so, a, a lifestyle, um, a philosophy of life and of living itself. Not in the beginning. In the beginning, it was just the visceral embodied experience of music. And literally, I would listen to music in high school because I remember this very distinctly, and I would notice how it was impacting me in parts of my body. Now, yeah. later I learned that, you know, through Ralph Ellison, who was a good friend and colleague of Albert Murray's, that, you know, music gives resonance to memory. So how we can, in our lives, be listening to certain music and we can then equate it with that period of our lives or a particular incident or circumstance in our lives. You know, uh, music has such a neurocognitive power. And so it reflects, as uh, the American philosopher Suzanne Langer said, you know, art is feeling in form. So music um, being that uh, invisible form <laughs> we can't see it, but it's it has powerful impact upon us. It expresses emotional power, emotional weight. Uh, it expresses feelings in a way, and that's part of the the draw of it because it, it expresses how we feel in a way that's nonverbal. Of, of course, unless you're talking about lyrics, mm -hmm. but just the music itself, um, the fundamental aspects of music, you know, rhythm, melody, harmony, and tone color, you know, timbre. Mm -hmm. um, these things have powerful impacts upon our, our very bodies. And then when you take it beyond the individual to the interpersonal uh, and you take it to, um, to the romantic and to dance and to ritual, then you, you get into the cultural forms and formations that the the role of music in ritual itself, which is the way that culture is actually transmitted over time. Mm. So, you know, I, I'm hopefully I, I'm, I'm not meandering too much. I'm trying to give you no, a no, sense I'm of, you know, because it's capacious. This is very capacious for me, but I appreciate your guidance to ask me certain questions so I can lead some of this stuff into a, 
more of a streamlined form. Well, no, it's 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 really I find it really interesting that the particular you the what you said about to begin with, it was just it wasn't a philosophy of life. It didn't have this kind of that kind of I guess you could maybe say intellectual articulation. Right. But like to begin with, it's just the sheer joy, the feeling, the kind of whatever's, and it's almost hard to uh, to express that. Well, I mean, it's maybe impossible to express that when you're a teenager or, or like when I'm five years old in that car. Like, well, how can you? You can't <laughs> exactly. find the words. But you go back to it, and you go back to it, and you go back to it. But it, but what's interesting to me is is something might be happening whereby as the music marinates in the body mm. and then as you, as you also, as you grow older, a kind of, um, uh, I, I want to say like, a uh, a, a clarification happens, like a crystallizing of, oh, I'm seeing, you know, like jazz, oh, for sure. like you start to see the principles in jazz, you start to see different elements, you know, and I want to talk about these things with your jazz leadership project and stuff, but it, as a, as a, it feels interesting as a, maybe a cognitive developmental thing that can happen in someone. I definitely you know? think is, it, I, I think that's the case. I think for, for, for many people, music, you know, may, may remain to be background or just entertainment. Um, but for me, it became, more of a intellectual and philosophical crystallization over time. Mm. I've always been a voracious reader. Um, and the more I read about not just art and culture, but primarily art and culture, um, the more I realized that this is really deep. This this goes into the depths of of human life and 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 the humanities in particular. Um, in a way that, wow, this is profound. You know, there were things that I would feel, like, for example, connection between jazz and democracy and democratic forms. I would feel that, but it was only upon reading the work of my late friend Stanley Crouch. And his work led me to the work of Ralph Ellison and Albert Murray. And tied into all of them are Winston Marsalis, who is someone I've known since 1993. Uh, one of the world's greatest trumpeters, classical and jazz, you know, since he came on the scene in the early 80s. So um, for, for me, this became a much richer, um, profound formulation of understanding and comprehension mm -hmm. um, over time i would say that started probably in the in, in my late 20s so i had about 10 years of really being deep 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 into the music as you know as music mm -hmm. our music um but then i started to really understand the historical cultural and philosophical depths and then and then that kind of understanding the music affords then moves beyond the music as well in a way definitely it, yeah right. the, music is, the music is central but yeah. it's connected and that's the thing yeah, if you're going to yeah, get yeah. to music in the meta crisis yeah and music as you know music as a tool for or resource for metanoia then you have to talk about how music is connected yeah. to all these things you know what I mean? Of course, and that's why metaphor has in the piece that you wrote is yeah. so true. And it seems like that's a big part of your work as well with the with the jazz leadership project. Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of um from what I know of it, which is is comes through the conversation I've seen in some of your writing, um, a lot of metaphor from of jazz and that, that, that brings different concepts to life. Could you speak a little bit about that work? Because what I'm really curious about yeah, Greg is 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 what principles from jazz um can be helpful to people in those contexts, and then how that comes alive, like how how you the work that you do, how it comes alive for people. Sure, I'd be glad to. Jazz Leadership Project is a for profit company that my wife Jewel and I run together, and 
we formed it, oh, I guess about seven, eight years ago now, as a way to help organizations, um, particularly corporations, uh, though we work with nonprofits, to improve their leadership and their team synergy capacity, you can say. Yeah. So we do it by using jazz as a model and a metaphor for that type of growth and development. So we have four principles, six practices. The first two principles are individually focused, like an individual leader. The first three principles are individual in orientation. The last two and the last three principles and practices are from the group perspective. And there are uh, analogies and metaphors woven in throughout uh, to, to allow people to connect not only what they're hearing about the music conceptually, but then once they hear the music, to then connect it to their own leadership development and, and how their teams work to get towards our very highest principle that we call ensemble mindset. That's something that we coined. So in a nutshell, that's what it is. And it's very powerful. It's a powerful methodology and, mm. and, and even a cultural technology of sorts because people, whether they know about jazz or not, you can feel it. You, mm. can, you can sense the connections that we're drawing and it provides a different perspectival view for people to understand themselves and how they work together with other people. Mm -hmm. And it's so, I guess as well, when there's something about, uh, it seems the, an authority in music, when music, when something is true of music, it seems to almost uh, carry a quality of truth that people can find it hard to dispute in a way. Is that? That's so interesting that you say that. I mean, when you mentioned truth, I think about uh, goodness, truth, and beauty. Mm. Um, and I think those are definitely interconnected, though they are conceptually separate uh, in, in Western philosophy. Mm. So I, I would say it was a felt sense of truth. Mm. It's definitely beauty. Yeah, and, it's, yeah, yeah. and it's and it's definitely goodness. One. It's definitely yeah. goodness too. The only thing is, it's interesting when you talk about the arts from an ethical perspective. It's neutral, and the reason I say that is because even though, of course, music makes us feel good, and music serves, you know, to to so many fructifying and generative functions in our lives. There's no question. But music, like the arts in general, can be used towards not so good ends. Yeah. Nazi Germany, they they used the spectacle of the arts and music for their own ends. So when we talk about the actual philosophy of it, you know, we can we can divvy it up, but I know we're not gonna dive too deep into that because we got other stuff to to come no, unless, but I, unless you want to no i mean it's 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 a good point because i think i mean my uh, my particular interest is to use it a, a, like it seems it seems kind of fairly um apparent and and i don't think many people would disagree that music has a, a particular power to it you know um and if we want to if we want to kind of use new art forms and music and 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 develop cultural practices that te te touch people in a very deep way to kind of produce transformations of consciousness to try and inspire a kind of um a shift that so many of us feel we need we have to be mindful that you know if you're tapping into this powerful stuff this this can go in very ugly directions that and is especially so true when, especially when people have that. kind of utopian like which I can, I personally can be criticized for, you know. I so hear you, man. I, I know what you mean. I, you know? I know what you mean. I mean, Jamie Wheel talks about uh, yeah uh, cults and and how you know throughout history there are these dynamics, you know, based on in part utopian thinking, where people you know they have a vision of the good, the true, the beautiful, 
Yeah. And they try to form community around it and other aspects of human reality, tragic aspects of human reality yeah. come into uh, come into fore and into being. So <clears throat> excuse me. Um yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about the the concept of antagonistic cooperation that you use in, in the Jazz Leadership Project? Because it I think it's some it's in something that's informed our work at Perspectiva with the anti debate. Uh, so I'd be interested to 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 share with you a little on that. Oh sure, be, yeah. be glad to. Okay, yeah. So um, antagonistic cooperation. You know, I mentioned four principles. The four principles are individual excellence, antagonistic cooperation, shared leadership, and ensemble mindset. Mm -hmm. Antagonistic cooperation derives from the what Joseph Campbell called the monomyth. You know, from the hero's journey tradition. So the idea is that the hero on their journey, excuse me, <clears throat> I'm so sorry about this. Um, I don't know, it seems to be dealing with some nasal stuff. Um, that the, the hero on his or her journey, and there is a heroine's journey that my wife writes about in our blog, Tune Into Leadership, where the hero's journey is more of an individual journey. The heroine's journey is like taking others along on yeah. the journey. Um, but there's going to be challenges along the way. There's going to be conflicts along the way. There's going to be competition along the way. So what antagonistic cooperation as a concept that sounds like an oxymoron in some ways, what it does is allows you to reframe things like challenge, competition, and conflict into a tool and resource for growth and development. So you don't have to view it as a negative. You view it as an, a reality of our lives and such, and as such, you can anticipate it coming and even look back to, we have a, a exercise we call challenges gift. We have people to think about a challenge that they've had in the past and the lessons they've learned from it so that they can view challenge as a gift as an aspect of antagonistic cooperation. So antagonistic cooperation uh, definitely is a very powerful principle that we utilize and, and it comes from the hero's journey. And how does that manifest within a jazz band? <laughs> how would that, how would the antagonistic cooperation? Uh... I'm glad you asked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It, it manifests in several ways. Um, there is the musical dynamic of call and response, where one aspect in jazz of call and response is called trading fours. This is fours, um, you, you have your know, measures or bars of music. So trading fours in jazz is where you have instrumentalists usually, though it could be vocalists who, who are scatting, which is a musical approximation of an instrumentalist style improvising in jazz, you trade bars of four bars or four measures of music. So you're trading fours and you're doing it in a way that often is competitive. It's like, oh, oh, you said that? Well, well this is my response to that. Oh yeah, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, but it's it's in fun and it's, and yeah. it's in res respectful play. See, yeah. so, and I guess uh, then you get the continuation of that with like, with break dancers and with rap battles and that. Oh kind yeah, of that that's part of the cultural continuum. Yeah, yeah. Of, of Afro American musical culture, absolutely. Yeah. So you you find that in in hip hop with hip hop battles in jazz they call them cutting contests, you know where it's like. Uh, you would battle on stage with someone of your same instrument to see who can one up each other, yeah. you know. But the yeah. thing is, but look at look at it developmentally. Actual violence is at a at a at a low ebb of. I mean, it's a key part of human history, past and present, obviously. But one of the things that ritual allows us to do is transform certain fundamental practices for human survival into forms that allow us to transcend 
the lo very lowest aspects of so you could have a a fight um symbolically you can have a symbolic fight as opposed to an actual fight you know mm -hmm. um so the cutting contests in jazz the the hip hop battles um those are two examples in music of antagonistic cooperation can i give you a, a quick story yeah go for it go for it yeah okay and this relates to hip hop a uh, 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 a style of music uh, particularly in terms of the lyrics with with some exceptions that I'm not that into um hip hop came along in the late mid to late 70s I was just getting into jazz at the time so I'm listening to Louis Armstrong, Clifford Brown, Miles Davis, Sonny Rollins, John Coltrane, <clears throat> Phil Woods, Michael Brecker. I'm listening to some of the greatest instrumentalists of the 20th century, no matter the form of music. I'm talking about up here. Yeah. I mean, the greats in terms of their, 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 their ability and capacity on their instruments. And I'm listening to rap and it's of my generation, yeah, but I just, I, I, I didn't, it didn't appeal to me in the same way because it didn't have the height, the depth, the breadth. It, it just didn't have it. That's what I was searching for. One of the things that Stanley Crouch, my late friend and writer, cultural critic said, is that young jazz musicians are playing jazz in part because they're aspiring to adulthood. So I was aspiring to adulthood and hip hop didn't seem to me to be, to have all that I needed, you know, for that. However, I did have an instance. This was a New Year's Eve party in Harlem at uh, 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 the house of a writer friend of mine whose children were having this party. And they had a component, a component of it where they had a rap battle. So you had three rappers who were in a circles and someone said, drop the beats. So they started the beats and each of them started to freestyle, which is in hip hop, the term for improvising your lyrics. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they each started and I'm observing this and I'm seeing how they are employing their own individual styles into what they do. They are, they're ranking, this is a term from my generation, ranking on the, the other, you know, rappers, but they're doing it in a way that's fun. They're doing it in a way that's playful, not serious. And in fact, as the, as each one is doing their thing, the others are listening and grooving with it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm, go ahead. You know, and then I was able to actually see a cultural continuity, not only to jazz in that moment, but to a foundational form in Afro-American culture called the ring shout, which was a tradition, you know, that derived ultimately from Africa, um, where there would be a group of folks in a circle and they would be, you know, they would sh be shuffling their feet and moving and grooving uh, together, and what would happen is a, an individual person would go into the middle of the circle and do their own individual dance. Then mm. they would come back to, the, and and others would go in the circle, and so this was a foundational ritual uh, in Afro American uh, culture, um, some of which is still uh, practiced among the Geechee and the Gullah. In, in Georgia, uh, my family happens to be from Georgia. Um, and I said, oh my God, I see the cultural continuity, mm -hmm. you know? So that's that gives you um, an example, I think, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, very much. It feels, as you're telling the story, uh, Greg, it feels very alive for me. You know, I can almost, I almost found myself like as you're telling the story, like grooving with you. Like I could feel <laughs> being there, feel, almost hear the beats, you know, and imagine, the kind of the various rappers um, riffing off each other and, 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 you know, we would say taking the mick, uh, yes. and, uh, you know, um, yeah. Wonderful. And you know, it, it reminds me about something um, 
Jonathan actually led a, a a session yesterday called Leading from Confusion. He was he was talking about culture and he talked about this model. And I forgive me because I, I can't remember the reference, but somebody had talked about how ideally you would have like you know you arts uh, 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 well with with culture what you have rather than ideally actually tragically what you have is you have arts which is is the kind of should be the kind of at the heart of culture but that's increasingly eaten by entertainment and it, it's there's a kind of move towards the and the, and, and 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 the commodification of yeah. the you know what they call the culture industries you know mm. Um, and, you know, the rapacious capitalist, you know, force, um, particularly in the yeah. West, where everything is, is becomes a commodity, commodity, you know, commodification. And, uh, you, you take something that's beautiful and you corporatize it and you monetize it and it becomes yet another product yeah and it you loses its, its its power you know it it, like, it, it could and it yeah. does often often yeah. but you still got that beauty thrown through you still got that power in there that's still inherent yeah in those art forms still you know yeah 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 um what's it like for me though when you talk about the that that moment that experience of people being together is with this, with this model, the, the 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 idea was that the arts is often eaten by kind of entertainment and that kind of consumption, and then that's kind of almost subsumed by this desire of, um, or this this kind of movement towards distraction, and then that's mo that's subsumed by then addiction. So rather than so now we have like rather than that kind of what you're talking about, which almost sounds like an experience of communitas, of deep communion among people. People are really there. They're in the groove. They're having something that's going to be life-affirming, kind of insoling to them. So often now, you know, when we when we kind of, our attention is in these kind of, you know, seven-inch, six-inch screens, and we're flicking through 10 seconds of some kind of music, some kind of, you know, it's, that's that's the kind of shift if we're if we're interested in cultural renewal and we're interested in these shifts it's how do we step into more spaces of what you just described there for people in, in those experiences of communitas you know communitas and flow yeah okay. flow exactly exactly okay i mean both individually and group flow i mean there's a we refer to this in jazz leadership project there's a gentleman named keith sawyer who wrote a book called Group Genius. He was a student of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who wrote the book on flow, but yeah. also a book on creativity. So Keith Sawyer is a, you know, one of, one of the top creativity researchers, and he talks about what it takes to go into group flow. So if we cannot achieve individual and group flow states, which is the opposite of the kind of sound bite, you know jumping from this, jumping from that, jumping from this. There is, there's got to be immersion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order to get into those flow states. And if we cannot get into those flow states, then I don't think we have a shot at addressing the meta crisis and achieving some metanoia beyond the paranoia. <laughs> yeah. So this is a great segue into one thing I'd like to ask you about, which is about the jazz, blues, and gospel traditions. Because to my mind... And again, like my my perspective, I can come, Greg, someone who's who's been in love with this this music for most of my life, but from a distance, you know. And so I have a romantic view of it, but I don't really. I've never been in a in a gospel church in the south on a Sunday morning, much as I'd love to. Experience. Oh, you haven't. You know oh I mean? man. No. Oh, you, you know? need to experience that. I've been, a, I've been, a, you know, I've been at BB King's blues, blues bar, All right. bar and I've been, I've been places, but you know, um, I was never, I was, I was never in Fifty Second Street and in, uh, in the fifties, you know, in the beep up era. Right, so, right. So, so I'm curious, like, but but these three different traditions, they're they're really interesting to me because you have you have the blues, you know, which is is this kind of secular tradition, but then as 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 you write so eloquently it's, it's really this deep existential kind of wisdom practice in itself and then you have the gospel which is this kind of um 
sacred devotional kind of music and then and then you have jazz which in some sense you could see blues and gospel i don't know if really you agree with this or not blues and gospel both as music as a kind of surrender as a kind of like you know like gospel has this quality of kind of religious surrender to 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 like the transcendent and then blues has the a kind of comical surrender to like the tragic like you know but then jazz has got this promethean quality of like almost like the energy of will like this kind of i'm gonna like I where can it. i go i don't I know love it i i i think you, i think seem, you i got you got something there man mm, they seem like uh yeah you got something and, and, the, and they're like, like the it. the three the, the the three kind of roots of this tradition that all kind of i mean they they, they co-mingled in the image but they're all quite distinct in their own way they are but it was only they, they for are. For many decades, they seemed like the the originals, and then you get rock and roll and soul and funk and hip hop. Right, and that, yeah, things. part of that, you know, that the culture is the root, and then you've got the the different, you know, development of that root that then branches out. So I agree. Um, I think that's a that's a good thesis. Um, I would say just to you know riff on your thesis. Hmm that the surrender in gospel is that, you know, you're, you're surrendering to the will of the Lord. Mm. You know, you, you, you've been instructed to make a joyful noise unto the Lord yeah. and, and you do that and you, 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 you acknowledge and you devote yourself to a sacred way of life. That is an attempt to ideally be Christ like, Okay, not too easy to, oh. to achieve. Um, and the blues is see as I as I work in myself and in my mind about this, the surrender part to the blues. I'm not so sure about that because in mm -hmm. fact the blues is a way of acknowledging the tragic acknowledging the hurt acknowledging the pain but in the very act of acknowledging it to even if it's only momentarily to transcend it so you're not surrendering to that in fact i'm going to give you uh some blues lyrics here there's a famous blues song called trouble in mind written in the mid-20s mm. and it's been done by great jazz artists, blues artists, bluegrass, country artists. And I'll just give you one or two stanzas. Okay, trouble in mind, I'm blue. I mean, this is, you, you, your mind is troubled. But I won't be blue always because the sun's going to shine in my back door someday. Okay, so there's a sense of hope amidst the reality that you're trouble in mind. Um, another lyric, another a stanza. I'm going to I'm going to go down to the river. Going to get me a rocking chair. If the Lord don't help me, I'm going to rock away from here. That's implying suicide. Mm. There's lyrics, not in the version that I printed out, but there's lyrics that talks about going to the railroad track, laying my head down on the railroad track. But then you come back to trouble in mind. I'm blue. You're acknowledging it. You're admitting it. But you got that that's glimmer of hope. But I won't be blue always because the sun's going to shine in my back door someday. Mm. So that's not about surrender. That's about mm. acknowledging the tragic and hoping for the post-tragic. Jazz is the post-tragic. Jazz mm -hmm. integrates uh, a blues aesthetic sensibility and blues in your sensibility and the, the, the hopeful optimism of, uh, of gospel mm -hmm. into one integrated musical art form. So mm -hmm. I would say that that's some of the connection. Another connection is within the context of black American culture, at least historically, the blues is something that you do secular on Saturday night what Albert Murray in his book Stomping the Blues called the Saturday Night Function. And what it, what's the Saturday Night Function? What's the function of it? 
to stomp away the blues temporarily of the week that just proceeded or the circumstances. I mean, you're literally dancing and you're romancing and you're, you're engaging in collective affirmation of life itself. Mm. Sunday morning is propitiation is devotion is acknowledging, you know, uh, ones, if you go into Christian theology, one's sinful nature and the, and the need to, you know, ask for forgiveness and that type of thing. But the point is that in both, in both the Saturday night function and the Sunday morning church service, music is central. Okay. So that's another connection. And jazz, I think, embodies the, the elements of and the spirit of both the Saturday night function and the Sunday morning church service. Can you say a little bit more about that, Greg, about how jazz is, has both those elements in it and embodies both those elements in it? Cause that's fascinating. Cause it's these, it's, it, there's a kind of polarity there you're describing. Well, it's a polarity, but it's grounded in the cultural continuum. Hmm. Okay. So in Afro-American musical history, the spirituals, which were done in a very, you know, devotional, you know, um, trying to think of the expression. Um, it's very, it what spirituals are not like gospel music. In the spirituals, you have uh, usually a choir singing in a very, uh, what's the word? It's very similar to church, not classical. I'm trying to think of uh, doing hymns. It's a very hymnal, you mm -hmm. know, where you're singing yeah. in unison, not a lot of harmony. Um, and the Tuskegee, the Fisk Jubilee singers are an example of that particular style. Okay. But gospel music incorporates the blues through Thomas Dorsey. And I urge everyone to check out a four part documentary on gospel music and preaching um, produced and written by Henry Louis Gates of Harvard. That's on the public broadcasting system in the States. I, I highly recommend that because it goes through the history of the music and it looks at the influence of um, Sally Martin her business genius who connected with Thomas Dorsey, who was a blues pianist and blues writer who then began writing gospel. So the blues gospel connection is there in the person of Thomas Dorsey and Sally Martin. Mm -hmm. Jazz is something that really captures, you know, this elements of, of both. It captures the, okay, I'll give you an example through the music and maybe we could hear a little music to 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 help this along too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Murray, Albert Murray talks about how, you know, in a blues statement, you know, what he calls, he calls jazz the fully orchestrated blues statement. But the blues statement itself, you know, you have a tale of woe. Okay, now, some people just think of the blues as that, but no, that's the blues as such. Blues music counterstates the blues as such. So you could have a, a, a singer singing, you know, a song that has lyrics, sad lyrics, but then you have instrumentalists who are commenting, like a Greek chorus, on those lyrics in a, in a way that is comical or sardonic, or is, you know, saying, ah, get out of here with that. Or, you know, <laughs> you know so I'll tell you. So you have, within the statement itself, you have these different dimensions. So you have the tragic dimensions, but you also have a comic dimension, okay? So as you as you take me deeper and deeper into the form, because these have depths. There, yeah, are, there are various depths there, but hopefully you get a sense. But I think we should hear some music to fulfill what Jonathan said in the beginning. Yeah, and, that'd be great. And if you could play uh, Two Thirds Adventure, this is a song that incorporates what 
Jelly Roll Morton, the great New Orleans, he was really the first great jazz uh, composer uh, and a great jazz pianist at the turn of the century. Uh, he called the Latin tinge. It's always a Latin tinge in jazz, but this brings the tinge out. And there, this is live in Cuba, the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra led by Wynton Marsalis. And you're going to hear the Latin tinge, but you'll also hear how they, ex example of shared leadership, ensemble mindset. Um, you, you, you hear and feel some of these elements we're talking about. So I like to hear that and then talk about some, some dimensions of it. Yeah. And how long do you want me to play it for, Greg? Well, I'd say... This is under under four minutes. You, know, you can okay. you can lower it, you know, as we're approaching four minutes. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. All right. Okay, let me just set this up. Uh, okay, hopefully you you should be able to see that just now. Can you give me a thumbs up, Greg? If you yes, can see yeah, yes. You can see. Okay, uh -huh. and then give me a thumbs up again, Greg, if you can hear it once I start okay. playing. Okay, I'll start it now. Okay. Thank you. 
that's me trying to do my smoothest fade out possible. That was nice. <laughs> that was nice. Like, you must have done radio. But you know, okay. <laughs> so I tell you, um, you know, it it speaks so much. I mean, that was four minutes, and this look at the the different journeys in that four minutes. Um, how it started off with a certain clave rhythm. Two thirds ref refers to the. Mm. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. And then it went into a straight jazz swing rhythm, you know. Um, and then it transitioned with the band coming back in. First, they were uh, accenting for the rhythm section. Uh, and then they went into a totally different groove, you know. You heard elements of solos by different um like the in the very beginning the bass had a little portion where he was taking a solo the piano took a solo um there was a little portion with the uh, alto saxophone in the beginning um usually the rhythm section is in support of the soloists and the band well then but they took center stage in that swing section uh, mm -hmm. And the band was then supporting them. So you see the dynamics of challenge and support there. That's, you know, a part of antagonistic cooperation. Also, those dynamics are there. Tension release, okay? Uh, in the solo itself, the piano solo, you heard, you heard aspects of the blues. You heard blues. You play the blues. So you could hear when he's dropping those blues, that blues yeah, yeah, yeah. feeling in there. Okay. It gets a little bit, little, a little bit funky, yeah. nasty, it, kind of like, yeah, you know, right. yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a part of it. But at the same time, it's joyful and it's jubilant, you know. And then um, there was those kind of glissandos the piano was doing. There was that's the, right. the comic aspect of it, you know, ah. the comic aspect of the blues. Like yeah. Talk about yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, um, that I think, you know will suffice now mm. uh, because I really do want to make sure we get Jonathan in here and that we can have people get a chance to come and I see some of the things that have been written in the chat. And so uh, appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds great. I'll bring, I'll bring Jonathan back in and mm -hmm. let me do that now. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Greg and Michael and that, selection of i mean just mind-blowing breathtaking music really uh i feel you know words are really not adequate after that at some level um moved actually just just you know it's a simple thing but, but after all the talking about it um i think there's something very important about defending the dignity of discussion um back in the day when i did work on the public understanding of spirituality a lot of people would somewhat lamely say oh all this talk but you know really spirituality is about practice and it's not that they were wrong but there was something a little bit facile about the critique because alongside the value of the of the experience of the thing itself there is the societal need to explore it and inquire into it and and, and clarify what it's about and what it means and you know, how it might be underutilized or underappreciated i suppose as i was listening i took um several notes and i can i can feel the extraordinary richness and potential of this um greg there was one moment and i noticed a kind of visceral reaction in a, in a, a way that i thought might be worth teasing out mm -hmm. um, you spoke a few times about the connection to use that word connection between music and the world and let me double. I want to focus on that, but I'll, I'll double. I'll, I'll I'll go lateral and come back to it. Okay. The lateral perspective is that um, some people here in the perspective of a group, because um, we had several events with Ian McGilchrist quite near the beginning of the creation of Perspectiva's community over the last eighteen months or so, we did a series called Attention as a Moral Act, and Ian's work is broadly about different hemispheric capacities um now he would be the first to say that almost everything in life is parsed through both hemispheres it's never as simple as saying you know music is the right and language the left it's never never that simple nonetheless 
um, there is something about the quality of music as a direct presencing experience, such as the one we just had with that clip, that makes me wonder if connection is quite the way we want to go, uh, if that's the right way of thinking about it. Mm. Because there's something about the holistic nature of the experience that um, we don't want to reduce to, to its parts. We do want to say that somehow this quality of experience and expertise and craftsmanship and training and all of the language you use of ensemble mindset and shared leadership and so on um, and post-tragic spirit and, you know, and, 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 and so conceptually very rich. We do want to say those things are relevant to the world. Of course we do. And we do want to even, you know, understand why you would say they connect to the world. But I'm wondering if there's something about the way we actually describe the contribution of music that needs to be quite careful with its language, lest we sort of lose and adulterate what it's really about. Um, there's something irreducible and palpable and visceral and enlivening that you want to give its own sovereignty to. Mm. That you want to say this alone is sovereign. It's not it's not that it has to account for itself in the mere formality of words and propositional logic. It doesn't have to sing for its supper in that sense, <laughs> right? It, it, there's something about the value of music being self-evident that I wonder if we need to fight for, that actually justifying it in a weird way might indirectly undermine it. Well, so, the thing is, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a meta thing. Right. Well, okay, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a meta thing in, in the sense of the music is right. The right. music literally speaks for itself. When I interviewed Winston Marsalis one time, he referred to a statement by Steve Coleman, who is a NEA jazz master and someone who's alto saxophonist and composer of note in jazz, and he said he heard Steve Coleman make a statement one time that he laughed at. He's, so a lot of times musicians don't talk about their music because the music is the statement. Right. The music speaks for itself. Right. So right. I, you know, and, and another word that I use is immersion. Right. I think it's really important for us, for us to immerse ourselves in the music, have it wash over us and in us, mm. and to do that in a shared way. Mm. That goes towards ritual. This is one of the reasons why, you know, you had two very successful pop music uh, recordings that went into the theaters, one by Taylor Swift, the other by Beyonce. And this is because it does on a large scale what human beings do, ritual. They get together and they sing and dance together. This is human. Yeah. And so, you know, it that was captured there. So, yes, at the same time, Habermas what deals with, you know, uh democracy and 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 communication and conversation, we we have to reflect on, we have to talk about it. And yes, it becomes meta when you do that. We're talking about music, which is something that you experience, but I'll, I'll go back to Albert Murray. <laughs> Someone asked him one time in a public uh, address he gave when doing the Q&A portion. He said, he said, well, you write so much about music, but what do you prefer more, literature and writing or music? And Murray was like, you know, <laughs> I'm a writer, you know, so, but, but music is the source of so much of, of, of his work that you can't separate it. Right. So to me, connection is one word that we should use because we don't need to separate these things, though by virtue of the left hemisphere and our analytical capacities, we're going to separate, we're going to categorize, we're going to hierarchize, we're going to do all that, right. you know? So, right. but, but the experience of it, which is why it was so important for us to actually have that musical example. Definitely. And and the second question, and I'll maybe my last one probably. Um individual and collective flow experiences and the need for immersion to obtain them. 
and you link that to the challenge of contending with metacrisis and the capacity to reach something like metanoia. This is not a small point. <laughs> this feels like yeah. right at the very heart of things. Yeah. And also one of the reasons why this, you know, incipient project is exciting because something about that feeling. Now, once you start trying to explain it and say, well, that feeling there, that thing somehow will be axiomatic for this policy agenda or whatever, mm. something has been lost. And yet, um, like you say, we live in both of these worlds and they're, they're, they, 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 they do connect at some level and they, all, they have their own uh, dignity and validity at the other level. But I'm wondering, you know, the smartphone, which, you know, there was a, a little uh, Substack post by someone called Sarcast, I think, I forget his first name. He was joking that if you look at the Lord of the Rings books and substitute the ring for the smartphone, that actually very often the, the, the power of the ring and the, the, the evil of the ring and the danger of the ring was remarkably uh, similar to the to sort of power of the, the, the phone, the seductive quality, how it pulls you in, it has a will of its own, all this kind of stuff. Wow. Um, I mention that now because when we think about that image that Michael alluded to in which you have addiction feeding off distraction, feeding off mm -hmm. entertainment, which only then feeds off art, which is the real source and beauty of what we value. I'm wondering what it would mean, what would it look like to make these immersive experiences, you know, ready at hand, uh, create them as affordances somehow culturally, such that we weren't lost in TikTok videos and Instagram feeds, um, but actually were somehow prefiguring a different kind of sensibility that was, you know, Michael called jazz Promethean, but had that quality of not being lost in someone else's miasma of imagery, uh, but rather beginning to sort of create our own story again. What, how would that begin to look? What would be an ideal form of that? Well, do we even know yet? I don't think we know yet. I do think that there are various projects and possibilities out there. But I would go beyond just, you know, what others have created. I think that in our algorithm-driven world, that even the world that you have created can be a source of what John Verveke might call foolishness. Because if you're caught in your the, the bubble of your own making, right. that won't be a source of wisdom, per right. se. So I think that we need, and uh, there's all kinds of leadership models, but I'm going to use one that comes out of art. We need curation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We need folks who are able to curate experiences for people that allow them to get a taste, right. that, that allow them to have certain experiences, like, say, the anti-debate. It's experiential. Yes, it's conceptual, but no, it was experiential and experimental, mm -hmm. which is a cognate for, not a cognate, but a, it's a, um, it's connected to improvisation. Experimentation right. and improvisation are very connected right, right. and very, very related, I should say. Yeah. So I think we need guides. We need mentors. Right. You know, in the hero's journey, the mentor is someone who helps the hero or a heroine right. to by advising them, by helping them, you know, point the way, by helping them to hone their skills. So we need mentors, we need curators, we need those who are going to help guide and people into some of these immersive experiences in an uncult-like way, or to use Jamie Wheel again as a reference, a, a positive dimension of, of cultus, mm -hmm. communitas. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to cultivate communitas. And this is where I think the 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 intellect offers something really important, actually. You know, when you were talking about like like being being cog cognitively aware of what we are engaged in. And so talking about, okay, this is what music is affording us here. We can actually step into an experience of transcendent or sacredness or you know and then there's, there's a danger with that because when you're too on the button and you know this with lyrics and music if you write a lyric that's just so explicit 
McGill just like it, it's like a joke. It dies, you know. Right. You, you have to be as, uh, implicit, but I think we're living in a time where we we need to learn how to do this quite skillfully, because if you if you don't, you could end up you could end up descending into cults, you know. And mm. I think that's where you see a lot, maybe in different the psychedelic world that th things are happening where where people are having these incredibly powerful experiences mm. and they're not held with that kind of awareness and so before you know it, you get gurus popping up and all kinds of things and if you try to do the same with music you know you don't want to start, you don't want to start meta modern evil cult so you, you have to go in there and say okay we're going in and we're we're trying to activate some pretty powerful soulful spiritual you know um inner machinery if you like mm -hmm. how do we do this in a way that's 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 wise and considered but yet also with conviction that this really matters and we go there you know and well, that's where the intellect that's what that kind of critical reflective needs to be there I, I, I would agree and i would also say that there's foreground and background right now music is literally in the foreground of this discussion oftentimes music is in the background so it could serve both purposes or functions so as you're creating communitas and creating community and creating these experiences, music can serve as a way to infuse those experiences without it being in the foreground. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there are times when it when music, because music is so powerful and so and there's such potential in music where it's literally in the foreground, like now, which is why I'm excited about this about this project. Mm -hmm. And that just leads me to, I just want to put a little plug for next week, because that relates exactly to my conversation with uh, Brother Fap Lin, who's a monastic teacher from the Plum Village Zen tradition. In Plum Village, music is used in the background a lot to enhance, to kind of um, enchant the experience, to bring a spiritual profundity. To, 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 it's kind of set, sits alongside other spiritual practices, other spiritual discourse that's mm -hmm. intended at transformation, but it kind of is there to augment it, you know? Right. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention that. There's more I'd love to ask, but I think it's only fair to give the others, other people here a chance to ask as well. So Michael, I'm happy to be evicted again. Um, and, um, and I'll let you choose the, the questions you want to, you want to receive if that's all right. Yeah, 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 of course.